I want to say thank you to this panel because one of the things that I think is a mark of resilience is the ability to respond just in time. <laughs> we got a note, hey, you guys are on a panel and you're going to talk about the role of mentorship. I'm like, okay. And uh, we had a Google Doc. Um, two of us met for 30 minutes. Two of us, three of us met for 20 minutes. <laughs> And otherwise, it's all been done asynchronously. So if you think you have to do a whole bunch of planning to make something magnificent happen, check your assumptions. It's just not true. So we've decided that one way to make sure that you got the very largest amount of content possible, we are not all going to say the same thing. Everybody has a different point of view, and it's one of the things I really value about all of you. As you can tell, you have ethnic diversity, you have age diversity, you're going to find out you have professional diversity, and extremely different points of view about mentoring and being a mentor, being a mentee, and what those processes are like. This is such an important piece of the evolution for each of us into maturity as an adult and the contribution that we make in society no matter what professional role we have. So you're going to hear first our personal stories, and then we'll talk a little more technically. You're going to have questions, so please write them down, because if you sit on them, you won't be listening to anything we're saying. So write them down so you can bring your attention back, and then we'll leave 10 minutes at the end for Q&A. Sound like a plan? <laughs> awesome. OK. I will tell you that without mentors, I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you guys. Um, I obviously was born with a mark on my face, which means the day I walked into kindergarten, I got bullied and made fun of, and that was true for my entire life. I learned resilience, thank <laughs> you, my friend, to say, wait a minute, but that's not all of who I am. But there were teachers, there were sports coaches, there were older students, there was the school nurse. And every step along my life journey, somebody was there for me to turn to to say, how come that happened? What's driving the experience that I'm having? What don't they understand about the wholeness of who I am? These are not technical questions. They are, like our first panel, the social and emotional language of being a human, of what I would call the right to dignity. Mentoring is hugely important in my book, and I've been the great beneficiary, and I give back. I currently have eight people that I'm mentoring in all kinds of different ways, whether it's leadership, or it's in the work that I do as a professional coach educator, or people who are professional coaches around the world who are feeling stuck and needing support. I'm thinking about one young woman in Nigeria. She's in Lagos and suffering under really great gender bias and role bias inside of her organization. And I know for sure that if it wasn't for our time mentoring once a month for an hour, she would have quit. You don't leave jobs in Nigeria and expect to survive and take care of your three kids as a single mom. Mm -hmm. It makes a difference, a big one. So let's hear from our panelists. Each of you can take a moment to tell your personal story. Who wants to go first? Yeah. Uh, you should go first. He got it. Sure. Mm. Uh, OK, the, the topic being uh, women, right? So I want to focus a little bit on uh, the fact that behind uh, every successful uh, women, there is a supporting family, there is a supporting husband, and uh, supporting kids, right? So. Uh, I think my, my, I want to basically a little bit dwell on uh, my wife's uh, uh, journey from uh, or uh, movement from the corporate world to the entrepreneurship world, right? And it wasn't uh, easy, right? And uh, even in my professional life, I have had uh, to work with and uh, even be, uh, uh, what shall I say, uh, reporting to a few uh, women, right? So, and uh, I found that uh, women have been like 
very nurturing caring emotional and uh, they are uh, great uh, task masters so i want to call out that uh, there should be a right mix of uh, women and uh, men and they should uh, collaborate and such collaboration uh, improves the life of uh, not only the family but uh, also the work culture and the companies that we deal with so i want to call out for uh, more uh, women power in the leadership yeah here yeah. here <laughs> <laughs> Um, so my story, it starts when I was a child. I didn't have very many role models. My parents weren't educated. Uh, they supported me as much as they could. So I was always seeking out my own mentors uh, as a child, trying to find that teacher, you know, as, um, as a friend, right, trying to find those friends who could support me. So in my first two years of teaching, I, just, I did the same thing. I just thought like, well, there's all these experts here. Like people have been teaching 20, 30, 40 years. Um, and they turned them into my mentor because there was, there was just no mentoring program almost 30 years ago when I started teaching. Uh, so along my journey, I've realized the power of mentoring because I've had to find my own. Uh, but also as an educator, I fell into mentoring as a role in my third year of teaching. So I spent those first two years really seeking it out. And in my third year, my department chair said, oh, you should mentor this first year teacher. And I said, I don't even know how to teach. I, I'm in my third year, like I'm still learning myself. Uh, but that was really a transformative moment for me to take that step to work with somebody who was only two years younger than I was, um, just starting in, in this profession, a, a young woman. Uh, and ask myself, okay, well, what expertise do I have? I must have something I can offer. Uh, and that year I kind of flew blindly, but then decided mentoring is, is very powerful on the mentor side. Uh, and so I started to mentor other teachers. And after 10 years of teaching, I designed my first mentoring program. Um, that's part of what I do now is, is design and implement teacher induction programs for, for beginning teachers. And so that's just a little piece of my story uh, of how I came to be here. <laughs> Thanks, Donna. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Hiba Al-Khatib. And my me passion for mentorship um, really started at a young age now when I reflect on it as a product of not seeing myself um, in the spaces that I was a part of. And when I got to undergrad at UC Berkeley, um, given the reputation of diversity um, and just how amazing of a school it is, I thought that that would change. I thought that I would join these um, spaces, particularly um, in public health, where my identity as a Palestinian, Muslim American, and daughter of immigrants was embraced and um, acknowledged. And I did not find that mentorship or that community. And that was a really big problem for me because if you cannot acknowledge you know, the health of a people who look like me, um, the health of women who look like me, the aspirations of women who look like me, then that is, you know, lacking humanity and the dehumanization of a people. And so that's something that I was, that did not sit well with me. And so I quickly realized that I needed to make a change, um, not just for myself, but for students um, who are gonna come in the future and trying to get rid of that struggle and barrier for them. So for me, I guess that's the first point of mentorship is trying to make pe other people's lives easier and the real value is embracing their identity. So I created Palestinian Public Health, which is my organization, and created that space on campus and across the nation and globally for students to get together and to meet with mentors. One of our main pillars um, is advocacy and mentorship. So to meet with mentors who, um, even if they don't necessarily have the same background as you or the same story as you, um, they at least give you that ability to embrace who you are. They acknowledge your identity, they acknowledge your struggles, and they give you that platform where you don't have to choose between career development and your identity. And that's what I noticed when I, I joined almost every like health organization and the only time uh, my struggles as a Palestinian was brought up was when I brought it up. And that's not how it should be, right? And then the mentors that I would go to is probably just that generic definition of like, here's a step-by-step, -step, you know, do this, take this class, you know, do this extracurricular, you wanna go to med school. And that's not what mentorship is, right? It's a sustainable relationship where um, you know, sometimes it's just checking in on the person and really empowering the person to believe in their own resilience, their own identity, their own power, and giving them that platform to grow. And you, my friend? I know, those are some tough acts to follow. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, my passion for, uh, for mentorship, it really comes from someone did it for me. 
right? I am, I, or I like to call myself, I am a leader by default because I don't like chaos. But I am, I am a, because I am an extrovert or introvert, usually I'm very quiet when I enter a space. And then if there happens to be chaos, then I'm like, okay, let me step in because I don't like chaos. And so what, in my professional career, like I said, when I started out, um, I was bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, very green, had no idea what was going on. And then just so happened a great mentor was, was placed in front of me as my boss. And she was absolutely amazing in the way that she kind of took me under her wing. She taught me how to move in spaces, because now I'm in a professional world. So I came from you know, being in school like all my life, and now all of a sudden I got my first big girl job, right? And so teaching me how to move in those spaces, teaching me how to speak. And so I had someone to do it for me. So once I gained the knowledge and the experience of being in the career, immediately I thought, it's time for me to get back. Like, I need to bring others with me to actually know about this career, to actually know that they can do it, to actually see people um, that can do it. Because subconsciously, that's what was given to me. At the time, I didn't realize that's what was happening, but that was given it to me. And so now that I have a platform, it's very important that I explain to girls and girls who look like me, that these are actually um, careers that they can go into, things that they can uh, do. Um, I'm very much an uh, advocate in that you can do whatever it is you want to do as long as you have the patience to learn it. Mm. Patience to learn it, huh? Yeah. OK. <laughs> and the courage to own one's identity yep. and to demand that it get respected. And to also, you know, it seems to me our next question is really about what are some of the current gaps that we see out there? Why aren't people being mentors? Why don't people seek out a mentor to support themselves when they're not feeling confident or competent or ready or good enough, whatever the phrases might be? I think I've got a lot of experts on this panel, so I want to let them talk specifically about mentoring. And I want to just offer three things to frame. There is a mindset myth that if I seek a mentor, I'm admitting I'm weak. And I can't afford to do that. So I won't. I'll fake it till I make it. Which creates that thing that Crystal was talking about called the imposter syndrome. There is another mindset myth, but this one is for mentors who think it takes too much time away from the important thing that they do professionally. And they forget the reciprocity in life. When we give back of ourselves generously, we will always receive in return two or three X, that same amount of energy. We need that serotonin hit. And until we start breaking that mindset that is so self-focused in order to take in other focus, we're going to continue to have people who have imposter syndrome and who struggle, who feel not seen and heard. The greatest crisis we have in America for sure, and I can see it in the European countries that I'm in as well, is a sense of belonging. I've been othered. I don't belong here. And we all know what the ripple effect is when we don't belong. We'll save that for another panel. The third is a cultural mindset. And in some ways, I think this is the, the most difficult one. In many cultures, the idea of being uh, available to receive, which means you're accepting that I'm not the smartest person in the room. I'm not the only one with the answer. And yet without this, we don't have collaboration. So there are ways in which identity has created barriers. And part of mentoring is about pulling down those screens and creating a space to be exactly who you are. So with that. Let's talk a little bit about the gaps you all have seen in your experience. So we have technology and academia and public health and clinical research and a JD. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Don't get me started on the legal profession. <laughs> I won't go there. Right? We have lots of different angles here to talk about what are some of the gaps that you see that keep mentorship from empowering girls and women. I can start. Um, yeah, thank you so much. That was a great intro. <laughs> um, a major gap that I think I, I want to piggyback on, which was just mentioned, was the time commitment. So a lot of the, a lot a big misconception is that when you mentor, you have to meet with your mentee like every week, every day. Um, it takes a lot of time. You know, you have to have every answer. 
That's something I always hear. Like, what if I don't know how to answer their question? And so when I think about the kind of mentor that I want to be on, or I want to be, excuse me, um, I think about the privilege that I had to have a mentor since I was born, which is my mother. And I think about wh what I appreciated so much about her mentorship um, and the values that I tried to carry with me. So one of them was that a lot of times when I go to her, sometimes she doesn't even say anything. <laughs> like, I just tell her what my problem is or I just express how I feel and I just want a listening ear. Okay, other times it has been, oh, I feel weak. Oh, I'm so overwhelmed. And she'll simply say, yes, you can. And I'll be like, yeah, you're right, <laughs> I can. Um, or I'll be nervous about a, a speaking session or uh, a presentation. And then she'll remind me about how many speaking sessions and presentations I did and how wonderful it went. So it's not that she had an answer, it's that she empowered me to remember who I am and the skills that I bring forth and the strength that I have within myself, right? And a really great example is when I started Palestinian Public Health, I had everything prepared and I of course went to my mother first to tell, tell her that I was doing this and that little voice in my head was like, what if it's not successful? So I went to her and I told her, you know, do you think this is a good idea? Like, what if it's not successful? And she looked at me and she was like, well, we'll never know unless you do it, <laughs> right? <laughs> like, how, how am I supposed to know? And then I was like, like, I never felt so dumb. I was like, yeah, you're right. Like, we will not. And she was like, you know, even if, it's, even if nobody supports it, even if it's not successful, the worst that can happen is failure. And the worst is, is that you tried. And if you're just impacting one person, she said this, she said, if you're just making a difference in the life of one person, one person, and I'm proud to say we've made a difference in a lot of people's lives. A lot of people have pursued public health just because of this community and safe space and mentorship that is available. That is a success. So this idea of you have to commit so much time, you have to have every answer, you have to influence the life of so many different people, you don't. If you can just influence one person, uh, if you can just empower one person to feel like they can use their own agency and voice um, and feel empowered, then that is a change and a big change that they'll carry on and a legacy that you've just instilled in at least one person. Hey, but I want to add a little data to that. We know that 60 minutes spent with another human being in a deeply respectful conversation, which we call professional coaching, but mentoring is similar to this, will touch 1,600 people in 30 days. Let's let that sink in for a second. When we are deeply seen, felt, heard, and understood, we change the way we talk to everybody in our lives. One person makes a big difference. All right, who are you passing the baton to? I know somebody here was trying to speak. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, well, in the education space, we're lifelong learners, and everyone needs a mentor, whether you're first starting out or you've, you're you know, 30 years into the profession. Um, and one of the major challenges is time. So if you're an educator in the room, you know that you are expected to do more and more and more and more. Uh, and I, you know, I've just seen the evolution of that in, in my time in education. Uh, so time is, is a major factor and particularly for beginning teachers who are really struggling because they're just trying to figure out what do I do tomorrow, how do I survive? And they need that mentor to work with them side by side, to co-plan, to co-teach, to observe them, give them feedback. Uh, and as I you know, already said, like, as you continue through your career, like, those mentors are so essential um, to, to us continuing to learn and grow and improve. So time is, is one challenge. Uh, another challenge in the teacher education space right now is the teacher shortage. So there just really aren't enough qualified people to mentor. Uh, that's something that I'm finding more and more. And you know, finding those, those teachers who have that depth of expertise, who can be very flexible, can be facilitative, instructive, uh, and, and, and know, like collaborative, like they know when to take a stance. Like, okay, now we need to work side by side. Okay, now I need to ask you some questions and push on your thinking, or I need to just tell you uh, what I think you should do, right? And, and how that might impact your, your learning. So um, just finding those, those people because so many people are leaving the profession is increasingly challenging. So those are just two. There's, there's, there's more, but those are uh, two to start with. Do you want to pass to the right? Yes. Sure. Uh, I, I want to come from uh, a little bit uh, 
like combined perspective, right? So basically, I believe uh, in the honest truth that uh, life is beautiful. Like you will, in the walk of life, uh, uh, encounter uh, uh, both situations, right? So one where uh, you can be a mentor and where you can be a mentee, right? And I believe in uh, being a student of life for the most part, right? So learn from everybody and uh, uh, suddenly life uh, is beautiful and you will get opportunities like where uh, you get to be a mentor. And so uh, the power of uh, uh, influencing and getting influence, right? So both are uh, important. And uh, I am in the education space, but more from the technology perspective, right? So, uh, so I find in my walk of life that uh, uh, I, I find it the easiest to deal with computers because it doesn't yell back, it doesn't talk back, it doesn't have emotions. <laughs> but uh, when it comes to people, I feel that uh, uh, as human beings, we need to be the bridge between technology and uh, the uh, the people space, right? And uh, uh, therefore, it's uh, important to uh, like not like I have learned a lot from uh, people who have spent uh, years in the industry just doing technology, just doing like database, just doing uh, like the back end or just doing the front end. And uh, it's like uh, at a stage of life where uh, I get a chance to now uh, lead technology initiatives or. Uh, uh, contribute to the education space via uh, technology. I feel that it's uh, it's. I feel honored. I feel honored that uh, uh, I get a chance to mentor others, and that uh, uh, that itself is a great uh, responsibility. I feel, and therefore I salute all the teachers of the world because uh, the power of mentorship is uh, really something uh, with which you can rest better, sleep better. And uh, uh, I think uh, that's, the, uh, that's the perspective I wanted to bring. Yeah. Mm. Good. That's great. Yeah. And Crystal, how about for you? Yeah, kind of piggybacking on what you said earlier, I think that the gap for young women is just the amount, the resource that's there, right? I don't think it should fall squarely on the shoulders of the teachers to be the mentors, right? Um, I think if in any community that we look in, in the United States, Hopefully, there are some successful women, I believe, wholeheartedly in that community. And I believe it's more about getting them together to actually acknowledge that, hey, there is a space, or we need to create a safe space for young girls to come to talk about their goals, their dreams, what's bothering them. And I think that that, that is the gap that is missing. If we rely, so teachers have so much to do. We can't just, they can't be everything, right? And they wanna go home and have families too. So I think if we actually created that, and again, with the time it doesn't even have to be every single day or once a week kids are very savvy most of them have cell phones you could probably just create a zoom meeting like hey guys let's just create a zoom space if they want a one-on-one -on -one, that's great but some people just do better whenever they're you know they feel less what's the word i'm looking for um they'll open up more if they're not in a crowded room or they're somewhere that they just you know comfortable space but i think more as women, and I hate to say it because then I feel like we're having to be the superwoman, right? We got to do it all. We got to mentor, got to be a mom, got to do this, got to do that. But for, th for those of us that may have a little bit more time on our hands, and there are some that are out there, if we could start creating a space for these young women to actually come in our communities to speak about these issues that they may be facing or even knowing like what they want to do in life, you know, someone in eighth grade might not know yet. And then even you exposing yourself to them to say, hey, I do this. Have you ever thought about it? Well, hey, I didn't even know it existed. So even just kind of creating that space, I think, for young women is probably the, the biggest Biggest, or one of the biggest gaps and hurdles that we see. And then putting that pressure solely on just our teachers to actually do that as well. We can do more as a community. You know, you're reminding me of uh, one of my favorite healthcare organizations. Uh, kind of goes the extra yard. They don't hold mentoring as discretionary. <laughs> it's it's uh, embedded into the fabric of their work. And bring a child to work day to Does your point, yes, anymore? they okay. absolutely do it. In <laughs> fact, they do it once a quarter. Wonderful. Wow. And they've implemented peer mentoring at every level of the organization. And it's uh, something that happens for six months after someone is onboarded. So there are some ways in which not just education, but the corporate world, once you step into it, mm -hmm. uh, where mentoring is much more prevalent. And I guess the question for me is, what is it? What, what, what is it in the 
emotional zeitgeist of society that we think that it's somehow shameful to need. Well, as women, we suffer from that superwoman syndrome. I gotta do it all. I gotta take care of mom and dad. I gotta take care of husband, a wife, uh, uh, kids over here. The dog's got this appointment. We right. have this, and, it, and it's because we have a nurture. We're natural nurturers, right? And so because of that, we, to me, we tend to take on more and we need to set more boundaries, right? <laughs> so that we don't feel overwhelmed and overworked because we are taking on all of these responsibilities. But I think, um, yeah, that's, that's to me where it comes from. We have this kind of superwoman syndrome and that it, you, might even, you might think I don't need the help, but you might think more, well, I just gotta do it all. And if it's gonna get done right, I gotta do it all, right? right. That, that whole, that, that syndrome there we have to let go of and actually empower others to do it because they can and you don't have to do it all. Which is really how I learned about the world of work because one of my first mentors was a man. And he made it really clear to me that if I kept on the trajectory I was on, which was I work seven days a week, usually 12 hours a day, and he said, y you'll never get promoted because you don't know how to let anybody else do anything for you. Right? So I think there are some, there's some interesting dynamics. Maybe it's gender identity. I think there are lots of things that go into identity, not just that, that influence us to think that we, we can't show weakness. Yes. So I wonder, what are some resources besides programmatic solutions? Yes, mentoring programs are necessary, especially in education and in healthcare, because of the caring nature, right? We want to give of ourselves. What are some other resource structures that we think would help people normalize and find benefit in getting a mentor and being a mentor? Um, uh, okay, before I answer, like, I try to um, delve into that question, right, uh, Janet, I wanted to also talk about uh, like the mentors, like uh, just because uh, the topic is uh, mentorship is uh, girls and women, I sincerely believe that uh, uh, to clap, it needs a diverse set of hands, right? So, and uh, therefore, uh, uh, the mentors, when we talk about, I want to encourage uh, women to have men mentors and uh, as well as uh, the, uh, uh, to be mentees and mentors, uh, regardless of, uh, like, I think uh, the, we live in a complex uh, uh, world where uh, the problems are uh, uh, need all of us to collaborate and to collaborate I think we need to uh, uh, give up our uh, gender identity for a little bit and uh, see what roles we each other play right because uh, in uh, my walk of life I have seen uh, women who are uh, like uh, like really good uh, taskmasters they are very empathetic they are very uh, uh, they can uh, what shall I say, they are like in most companies that I have walked through, right? So they are the ones who are committed to the cause for a longer time. They are like while uh, uh, the, the bro code, uh, basically usually people jump around a little bit more in the men uh, folk, right? But uh, women have been committed to the cause. So therefore, I think uh, it's important that uh, we all collaborate together, right? So and uh, collaborate together, I think, uh, uh, being the only man on the panel, I, I welcome uh, uh, women with uh, uh, warm hands, and uh, I think we all should collaborate. That's the first uh, point I wanted to make. So, yeah. And you modeled that beautifully with us. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and in terms of uh, resources, I feel uh, uh, you shouldn't go looking for a mentor. Like that's the first part, right? So basically, wherever you see a gap, I think uh, there are uh, tons of resources. Like uh, LinkedIn is a great resource, or uh, your walk of life in family, work, or friend circle. I think you will always, uh, you, and it's not necessary always to have uh, a single mentor too. So depending on the knowledge gap that you are bridging or uh, that you want to uh, inculcate, I think uh, it's uh, you should uh, look for uh, what shall I say, micro commitment from mentors too. So I think you should look all around and uh, learn from. Most people. So I think that's what makes the world beautiful, I feel, yeah. Um, for me, there's a lot of, a lot of thoughts coming. Um, when I was an undergrad, like I said, I, I did not have those resources um, laid out. I did not know who to approach, who to talk to, who to get mentorship from. Um, I was blessed to have an inner circle, right, my family that was extremely supportive, my mother, but school-wise at 
like the university, I was I was all over the place. So um, naturally, I went to the advisor, um, and it was the most. It was not helpful at all. Um, he could not answer like any questions, and that's part of you know what we're discussing here. With it doesn't fall on just the leadership, right? The academic leadership, the counselors, the teachers, because they don't always have the answer, and they don't always know what to say, and oftentimes. They might, that just might be their job because they have a passion for it, but they did not go to the same school. They d are not doing the same thing, so they don't always know what to say or to do. So after that experience, I found community on campus, right? I said I'm Muslim, so I joined the MSA, the Muslim Student Association, and I found um, older women, right? Older men who are juniors, seniors, who are about to graduate, who went through the same struggles that I'm going through, and I told them, you know, who do I go to? And it ended up being them. <laughs> Right? They would tell me, oh, this class is hard. Or, you know, this class is easy, don't spend so much time. Right? Or they would give me previous study guides or uh, resources or guide me. Right? And they also didn't always have the answer, but it was a step in the right direction. And then in terms of my Palestinian identity and being in the health space and not seeing Palestinian health um, you know, ever mentioned, well, then I was like, okay, let me step into that mentor role. Let me make that change. Right, let me start that change and then other people who are probably also internally passionate about it but have not found that community, now they can join me, we can join forces and we can build a community. Right, so it's, it's like leveraging your own power, it's finding that community, it's finding those diverse voices um, and it's not always easy to find a mentor. And the other thing um, that we did, one of the first things that I did when I started my organization was a Palestinians in Public Health panel. Right, so these were real people who are in public health, um, and not all of them even did anything about Palestine <laughs> on the panel. But just the fact that their identity was front and center for, for young girls, for young men who want to be in this field, it made a difference. It made a difference to see them staged, right? It made a difference to see that you can be successful being your full self, right? And then a part of our organization is so many different diverse voices. We worked with a black nonprofit that is just absolutely amazing and our struggles are interconnected. So we help them, they help us. We run a, a community-based clinic for, and we do a breakfast program that's modeled after you know, um, the efforts from, by the Black Panthers. So there's just so much opportunity for community building, so many diverse voices that can come together. You don't all have the same story, you don't have all the same background, um, but if, you lead with compassion. I think that's a main point for a mentor. You need to be compassionate. Um, you need to, you know, understand that there is love in this world. There is humanity, and there's just so much opportunity for growth. And the last thing I want to say is that the inner circle makes a huge difference. If you're surrounded by friends who are not supporting you, who are giving you backhanded comments, when you want to start something, they're like, "Oh, it's too much work, right?" If my mother had told me, "Oh, it's too much work." Uh, why, why, you can be successful, yes, anyone, I think success is subjective, right? Anyone can be successful, but is that what you want out of this life, or do you want to make an impact and feel fulfilled? So if she had told me it's too much work, I don't know if I would have done everything I've done to this point. So if you feel like your inner circle, your friends, those are mentors for life, right? They impact you, they impact your outlook on life, they impact the change you want to make, and if they're not being supportive, then you might start letting go of your passions based on their discouragement. So mentors are very diverse. So I'm hearing use your agency on your inner family, and that will give you the formula to collaborate. Yeah. That's beautiful, Hiba. Thank you. Go ahead, Donna. Oh, I was just going to say that, of course, there's lots of mentoring programs out there, right, and, and organizations. Um, and there's so much informal mentoring, right, as we're hearing on this panel, that is so powerful. So take a step back, look around your community, look around your workplace and ask yourself, is there someone here who is, can be an informal mentor, right? It doesn't have to be a formalized, you must spend so much time with a person per week relationship. Uh, mentors are everywhere. So that's, yeah, that, I guess that would be my recommendation. Punchline. <laughs> Hey, Crystal. Oh, I'm so privileged to be on this panel. And when she talked about older men and women, juniors and seniors, I said, oh, Lord. <laughs> Look, as a child in the 1900s. <laughs> um, <laughs> back, back in the 1900s when I was in college. Um, <laughs> it, I, I think as, as, as a mentors, we need to go to where the girls and the and the and the young men are right. That, I think that's one of the things we need to do. We need to go to where they are. Yes, you can connect on LinkedIn. Yes, you can try to find somebody, but we need to go to where they are, right? That's that as as adults, 
right? That's what we need to do. If we want to have more mentorship in communities, we need to go to where they are. That's one. Secondly, as a mentor, we, you need to pick people that want to do it. Because when you have a mentor that feels like they got to be drugged into it or they really don't want to do it, they're not going to be committed. You don't want them to be a part of your community. Don't be afraid to say no. Thank you, but no thank you, right? So let's make sure that they actually want to be a part of that role. And um, for, for young, like I said, one, if we show up in the community, I think one that, that will start helping them to know where to actually go and, and, to, and to go out. For those who, because I, I think, when I, when I hear girl, I think anywhere from like, you know, 14 and older. So a 14 year old is probably not, some of them will, but um, you know, some of them won't have the courage to actually get on LinkedIn and talk to somebody that I don't know that might be a mentor. But I encourage you to get out, to talk, to find somebody you kind of vibe with, right? Because each mentor that I have had, I had to have a, a vibe with them. We had to kind of get along. It didn't make it, it wasn't going to do me any good if, you know, our personalities didn't mesh, right? Yes, I can learn something from them, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to learn something from somebody more that I mesh with. And, you know, when you're seen in the community, when you're known in the community, I think it makes you more approachable, right? When I go talk to students, I don't look like this, right? I got on a t-shirt, jeans, we're playing basketball. You know, I'm, I'm going to them, I'm meeting them where they are. And I think sometimes we can get so far in our careers or so high up, you know, um, that we actually forget that at one point we were kids, at one point you were this shy little kid, you know, how, how do you actually reach back out? But I think the biggest thing is as adults, we need to start going to where the, there's, a, there's a gap, right? Start going to where young women are, start going to, you know, how you want them to lead or come into STEM or come into whatever, um, whatever career you want them to come into. But yeah, we have to go to the people. You know, I think there's another word besides compassion, which I love that, um, Hibba, that you brought that in, and the word's vulnerability. Mm -hmm. I, I think that it's important for young girls in particular to get that they don't have to grow up so fast, yes. right? You're fine right where you are. Yes. And I was there once too. I know what it feels like to feel uncertain, to be doubtful, to, to have those moments when all you wanna do is go hide in the bathroom and cry, okay, that's a moment. I had those two. I'll share a story with you. And what's your story? Right, to, to give it back. Sometimes mentoring is not formal. I, I really appreciate the, you know, the, the moments. Take advantage of those moments to see someone, truly. So we have about four minutes left. Are there any particular questions that you wrote down because I told you to do that so that you could listen? <laughs> mm -hmm. Do you want to ask us now? Can, can I just add one more thing? Sure. You were talking about circle of friends, and I think that is huge. Ah. Where you are in your life, my friends, when I was 20, I have a couple, but it looks very different now at 44. So one thing you have to know is that when you're preparing to go to the next level, everybody can't go with you. So those that are not supporting you, you thank them for the friendship and the time they had. But mm -hmm. your circle, it's going to look different as you navigate life, as you move further, as you grow. So don't be afraid because a lot of times we, as women, I think we have a tendency to try to hold on, right? It's what we know. It's comfortable. Um, it's, it feels good. It's just to make sure that you're open to new opportunities because your friend circle will change. And you want it to change, right? You want to be surrounded with like-minded people. You want to be surrounded with people that are doing better than you so that you can learn from them. So just don't be afraid of that. We could go on for hours, but we won't. <laughs> Are there any particular questions? Come get a mic, please. Keep keeping those steps going. Uh, actually, just as I was listening to all of you, I thought, um, you know, if you, all of the mentors that you've had, what is one line that you just can't ever forget, like it's so p much a part of you and you got that from your mentor. Yeah, I, I think I mentioned it earlier for me, um, it's that you'll never know unless you try and that the worst that can happen is that you fail and that you try again. And the other one is that leaders build leaders, right? My mother always says this, you are a leader and a mentor if you truly want to see other people succeed. And that's the circle of life, right? As you get more successful, you should be pulling more people up with you. And I always think about this because 
um, yes, I worked hard, but I could have, you know, been born in Palestine where my family is, and I definitely would not have had the opportunities that I had being born in America. So by chance, I am a woman born here, right? And through my faith and my religion, I believe that, you know, God allowed me to fill this role of leadership, and I have a responsibility to give it back, right? I have a responsibility to amplify voices that have been silenced and bring them up with me. And I truly believe that everybody has the ability inside of them to make a change and to be powerful, but sometimes it just takes someone um, telling you that you are capable, right? So I think it goes such a long way for you if you see somebody down or you see someone discouraged to be like, yes, you can. Just, just try, you know, be their first supporter. A lot, of, a lot of the students that I mentored, and you know, I talked about that panel. When I did that panel, I was an undergrad. And then throughout my master's, I sat on master's of public health panel and gave it back. And now I mentor students who want to be in public health and I'm giving it back. And a lot of times I tell them, well, they're like, is this a good idea? I'm like, well, I don't know, let's try. And I'll be your first supporter. I'll be the first, I'll come to your event. Right, so that just goes such a long way in like never forgetting that even when you are successful that you need to bring other people with you and you have a responsibility to give back and to not be selfish and just like, thinking, oh, like, you know, I, I did it, like, why should I not care about anyone else? Um, so, yeah. Thanks, Heba. Uh, I think uh, some of the uh, um, lessons that I've learned are, uh, like, uh, that it's important to have a vision, right? So it's like, uh, I don't know whether I learned it from a single individual or uh, over life. I think it's important to have a vision. And to execute that vision, it takes a lot of hard work. Right, uh, and uh, so what I find uh, is that uh, it's one, it's important to have a goal and important to be guided and once you have the vision, you will realize that uh, if it's your own vision, you will need a lot of people to collaborate and therefore, whether you call yourself a mentor, a mentee or whatever, <laughs> I think you need to collaborate. I think uh, you, to get to somewhere in life, you need to collaborate. That's the bottom line I want to get to. Yeah. Well, on that note of collaboration, many years ago, I helped start a school, uh, and it was side-by-side -side leadership. So our principal was there and was an important decision maker, and also all of us as teachers were decision makers. And he said to us as a faculty, you know, this is really hard work. And sometimes you might make assumptions about other people, uh, you, you know, might come to the space not feeling positive or, or carrying something with you. And he said, assume goodwill. He said, this is, this is really what has carried me through my career. Uh, and just step back, ch check your assumptions, right? Um, and assume that everybody has the best intentions. And that has been so instrumental both as a mentor and as somebody being mentored. I'll leave you with my favorite, I say it all the time, leaders eat last. It's a book by Simon Sinek if you haven't heard of it. But as a leader, your job is to actually pull your team along. Your job is to get out there in the front lines and help that you're not somewhere um, just yelling from the rooftops. But I, I live by that motto, leaders eat last. And mine is, I don't know, is the doorway to everything you want in life. Yeah. Very good. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. <laughs>